May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I wonder if anybody here, perhaps some of our children, have sometimes not been believed when you've told mum something. And I wonder how that felt. I mean, obviously, sometimes you might have been telling fibs to mum, but when you told the truth and mum didn't believe you, I wonder how that felt. Well, it's a bit like that in, in our reading today about the resurrection. It was a group of women, not just any old women, but named women, Mary, Joanna, James's mum, Mary, and a whole bunch of others who were the first witnesses to the resurrection. And forgive me for a bit of eye roll when we read that the, when the women told the men about this, it seemed to them an idle tale. Well, fair play, Peter goes and has a look, and we're told, goes home. Well, thanks for sharing, Peter. Um, it's down to the women to alert the community that something extraordinary had happened that Jesus was no longer dead in the tomb, but had risen again, according to two angelic figures. Well, why would resurrection be dismissed in this way as idle talk? Why would the women not be believed? Jesus had been leaving some rather massive hints during his ministry that this was going to happen. Well, it was something extraordinary. And we've come to rather take it in our stride. But those early Jews and certainly the early Romans and Greeks who heard of this resurrection would have a rather different take on it. Most of those who heard the first Easter gospel might have found it grotesque, even frightening. For them, resurrection was not a sign of joyful hope, but an alarming oddity, something potentially very dangerous. Because in classical thought, the dead, if they survived at all, lived in their own shadowy world where they were sort of condemned to a half-life of yearning and sadness. But for them to return would have been terrifying and unnatural. Even the Jews who, who first made the concept of resurrection a positive thing thought that it would happen at the end of time. News that someone had been raised from the dead now was quite extraordinary. So perhaps we can begin to understand why the women's story was dismissed as an idle tale and why, as in the other Gospels, we're told the disciples flee from the tomb, shaken and disturbed. So what was it about the dead rising that left people confused and terrified? Well, we mustn't ever forget that our view of the world is completely different. And, and really, it's not so long ago that people routinely lost children and spouses and family members at an early age. Death was much more common, and as we go further back in time, death becomes even more commonplace. People did not expect to live into old age, as disease, pestilence, and war usually saw people off at an early age. Ancient empires, and indeed modern dictators, specialize in mass slaughter. Empires grew and survived by assuming that enormous quantities of human lives were expendable and unimportant. Those who fell victim to the system simply disappeared. But what if they didn't? Here was a message that might well cause alarm. An executed criminal, instead of disappearing into oblivion, He's brought back into the world, and his friends are told to speak in his name to his killers, telling them that for their life and health, they must trust that he has made peace with them for them with God. And this was not just a one-off, according to those followers, that Jesus rising from the dead meant that all would be raised, and that no life could ever be forgotten or obliterated. From now on, no one can be forgotten. 
because Christians proclaim that our lives are precious, that we are made in the image of God, unique, wonderful, precious in his sight, and that death doesn't signify the end of that relationship with God and with each other. So no one can be forgotten. And we often pray that no one dies alone. We pray for the lonely and the neglected. And our churches are places where all are welcome, respected and valued. But that's radical stuff. We sort of take it for granted. For us, it's obvious. But our faith, Christianity, brought about a sea change in people's thinking. Because in the ancient world, there was absolutely no assumption that life was precious. Fathers could kill their children, masters their slaves, crowds flocked to see criminals or prisoners of war killing each other in their theatres. Massacre was a normal tool of war. And when all is said and done about how Christianity has so often failed in its own vision, the bare fact is that it brought about an irreversible shift in human culture. Human value could not be extinguished by violence or death. No one could be forgotten. And it's something we must proclaim with renewed urgency today because our world has stopped believing this, has stopped seeing life as precious, and far, far too many people live subhuman lives, lives lacking the dignity of food, of work, of shelter, of safety, of security. We proclaim today that the resurrection changes everything that God holds the lives of everyone, including the lives of those whose lives have been violently cut short or damaged by oppression. Everyone has value. If God can raise the messenger of his word and the giver of his life, a man who has been through the dehumanizing process of a Roman state execution, a process carefully designed to humiliate and obliterate, then the imperial power may well begin to worry. And we have seen so many powers that have sought to obliterate their victims as if the resurrection never happened. The Holocaust, the mass killings in the Soviet Union, the revolutionary years in China. What's happening right now in Ukraine? And that reminds us that it doesn't have to be an imperial power. It can be our neighbors who turn into murderers. And so we must remember and we must regain the fact and we must tell everybody that Christianity reshaped world thinking. Because you can't fit the resurrection into conventional language. It's extraordinary. And if you try and put it into conventional language, it all goes wrong. If you sort of try and make it into a universal truth, you know, Good Friday commemorates sacrifice and Easter is an achievement of victory over suffering. You know, and many would go on in, in a sort of muddled attempt to please everyone that all faiths in Britain can proclaim these common themes. Well, you don't achieve anything by downgrading the startling message of Easter. No Muslim would expect me on Easter day to be preaching a generalized half-truth that out of suffering, goodness can triumph. They would rightly be expecting me to preach about something unique, something that cannot be contained in the vague spirituality of Britain today. Because with the death and resurrection of Jesus, the world is a different place because the dead can no longer be forgotten. Relationships do not end. Life is precious. And we live in a society that, it can some, that believes it can somehow reach the Christian vision without the Christian God. You know, we sort of believe that we're moving in a brave new world under our own steam. We can extend our lives, we can improve and modify them in ways. That is wonderful and amazing, but some of it takes us into very murky waters. 
well away from the idea that all life is precious. Look how clever our world is, we say. We can do species bending. Utopia must just be around the corner. Well, Christians believe that no human being is a leave evolutionary byproduct to be managed or manipulated. And Easter is about real life. It's not about escapist fantasies into bunnies and Easter eggs. Easter is about God's judgment calling the world to account. He doesn't send his angels against us for lack of reverence for life. He gave us his son to live among us, to die among us, and then raised him to show how precious we are to him. So Christ our Lord, the firstborn from the dead, forgives our sinful forgetfulness and breathes warmth into our lukewarm love. He leaves no soul in anonymity or oblivion, but gives to all the dignity of a name, a presence, and the promise of resurrected life. He is risen. He is not here. He is present everywhere and to all. He is risen. Hallelujah.